Hello, this is Clive Friddle. This is The Current. The Current is still um, traveling outside of New York City, um, and it is particularly appropriate, therefore, as we have an episode ready for the middle of summer, for the middle of July, that we are joined by uh, the great Rick Steves. Uh, hi, Rick. Very nice of you to join us. I don't know how often I'm introduced as the great Rick Steves. It sounds like I'm a medieval king or something, but well, it's you, great to be with you. You are you're the number one travel book uh, author in America. You you produce books for traveling Americans uh, up and down the country. I think you've you've sold you sell about eighty thousand copies of your best selling book each year, and uh, it's a vast yeah. enterprise that you've created. So I think uh, thank I you. Think you're our man for the midsummer. So we're. Uh, we're especially um, thrilled to talk to you because this is a summer pretty much unlike any other for most of us in terms of travel. Um, and I wanted to ask you, actually, I wanted to take a step back and say, you love travel. It means a lot to you. So maybe you could help us understand what it is we're missing. What, what, what do we lose when we are denied the freedom to, to go wherever we want to go? You know, this coronavirus crisis is a chance to live in a different world and kind of realize what you liked about the previous world. And uh, I've got complete um, confidence that we'll be back to something approaching normal sooner or later, but patience is the key now. But from my perch here, this is the first time I've been home uh, in the summer for 30 years. I'm always in Europe working on my guidebooks. And um, I love travel. It's, I would say it's accelerated living. Um, it, I like the word carbonate. It carbonates my life. It brings different colors to it, uh, more diversity. It reminds me I am not the norm. It's really important for us to think that we are not the norm. And uh, those who don't travel are more likely to think they are the norm. Um, I think when you travel, you become less fearful. We have a lot of fear in our country, and, and when you travel, you you realize the world's filled with beautiful people, and you are not um, afraid of uh, the fact that people do things differently, or, or they look differently, or they have different uh, um, ways of tackling common problems. You, you celebrate it. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, I've been thinking a lot about why we travel. In fact, I'm writing a script right now for a TV show called Why We Travel. And uh, it's really going to celebrate the value of travel as for a little while we're not able to travel. And then the flip side of that is we can employ that traveler's spirit here at home and carbonate our lives and celebrate diversity and get out of our comfort zone, which is part of the joy of travel. We can do that without, uh, without leaving our, our neighborhood. Uh, and that's a challenge. And, uh, during this crisis, that's something I've been uh, focusing on, is employing my traveler spirit while I'm here locked down. So can, can you just tell us, I'm sure you've told, told this story before, but were you born with kind of itchy feet or was there, a, was there a travel experience which really set you off? You know, I was not born with itchy feet. I think if we're sort of a result of this serendipity of our who we're born into, what family we're born to. It just put, it sets the table for us. We can certainly change that, but um, it's no coincidence that my grandparents came from Norway and I'm a Lutheran. And, uh, you know, it's just my family heritage. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I would have stayed here in the Northwest and gone camping and hiking. Uh, you know, I was raised here in Seattle. Uh, but one day, my dad, who is a piano teacher, decided to import pianos from Germany. So we went to Europe when I was 14 years old to see the piano factories. Suddenly, I realized the world's a bigger place. And a number of um, things happened to me on that trip. You know, I watched Neil Armstrong walk on the moon uh, in Norway with relatives uh, sitting on the carpet in front of the TV and listening to the broadcast in Norwegian. And leap the script from Ansketrin and a giant leap for mankind. And um, uh, even as a 14 year old, I realized, uh, you know, well, this was one of those jolts that takes you out of your ethnocentrism a little bit. But I knew my friends back home were waving American flags, and they didn't know that all over the world, kids like me were sitting in front of TVs uh, celebrating the moon landing as a human accomplishment more than an Amer as much as an American accomplishment. You know, that was an example of one of the little serendipitous moments that 
that kind of steers your perspective and it changes the trajectory of your life. Um, same thing, I was uh, in a visiting a piano factory in Vienna with my dad and they took us out to this dusty little town on the Hungarian border. And I met a man, an old guy with a handlebar mustache and a fancy carved pipe and um, sitting in a wine garden telling stories about actually seeing the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in 1914. And I was just going, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and uh, I ended up getting a history degree just, just for kicks. Um, I, I mean, I always like to say I got a history degree accidentally. I, I, I just enjoyed history classes so much. I was surprised they gave us credit for it. But um, yeah, it was, um, my parents took me to Europe and I realized the world uh, is a welcoming place. And um uh, I've been going there ever since. Um, and then I've noticed in my own world, I, I've only had two jobs, teaching piano and teaching travel. And those are two of my loves. I just love to teach what I really enjoy and help other people enjoy it too. So that's been my mission. I've been at this for 40 years or so. I've got 100 employees. I've got uh, technology beyond my wildest dreams to amplify my teaching. But I'm really doing the same thing now that I was doing when I was a college kid is going to Europe, making mistakes, taking careful notes, coming home and, and uh, sharing the lessons I've learned so people can travel smarter. So my next question is, I'm sure people have said, well, Rick, you, you go to, I think you have 75 different countries um, that you publish about. Um, but there's a great, there's, there's a large stretch of the world that you, you, you don't go to. Um, right. the, your focus is Europe. Um, are you ever tempted to to get beyond uh, Europe and go elsewhere? What, what is, why has Europe held this uh, this grip on on your travel? Well, several reasons. Um, if I was traveling for kicks, I would travel all over the world. But I'm really not that well traveled. I've spent four months a year overseas ever since I was a college kid. Uh, but it's almost all in Europe. I'm not playing. I'm not on vacation. I'm working really, really hard when I'm on the road, and um, I want to be really good at what I do. I'm sort of, I don't have a lot of respect for people who will just go anywhere and become an overnight expert. Um, you know, I have, I've got 25 years of tour guiding experience and 40 years of guidebook research experience um, in Europe. And I need every one of those years to do a good job. Uh, I once wrote a guidebook to Asia called Asia Through the Back Door because my favorite country is India. And I love traveling in Indonesia and uh, I love Japan, uh, but um, I really decided I want to be the best because I don't want to abuse my marketing tricks or my uh, ability to con people into buying one of my books. I want it to really be good. I want when somebody takes four books with them on a trip, I want the three books they leave on their hotel bed to not be mine. I want my book to be <laughs> the one they take out on the streets. And I, uh, <laughs> I, I have a strong feeling it is. Um, so uh, I've decided to be focused. Um, but I want to stress, Europe is not necessarily my favorite place to travel. I was just in Ethiopia and I was just in Guatemala making TV shows. I love traveling there. But um, the other thing is my heritage is European. Uh, I, a lot of people want to, you know, they got this deep down desire to find their roots to go to a graveyard to see their family's name on the tombstones and piece that all together. I could care less about that. Uh, it would be a total, would do nothing for me. But I've got the same passion for finding my cultural roots. You know, what's the story of my family? What's the story of from where we came from? So I'm fascinated by that. Um, I've always, um, you know, I've got a, a degree in European history. So, um, you know, I just, a good writer has to have a context. I, I'm amazed at the context a lot of these uh, people who write wonderful historical novels have. Um, and uh, even as a travel writer, I need a historical context. I'm, I'm, I'm working on a, uh, a, a new series, a TV series, which is going to be the story of Europe, uh, history and art. And it's going to take us from the pyramids to Picasso. And I need to have a lot of background in that to do the job that I want to do. So I've decided to focus uh, from a from a business point of view. Europe is a huge market. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's only uh, one book that outsells the Rick Steves Italy book, and that's the uh, guide to uh, Disney World in Orlando. So I, I can't compete with that. That's escape travel. But for real travel, 
um, Europe is the best market. And I just, uh, I appreciate that because if you work really hard, uh, you don't want to, I'm a businessman, you know, I don't want to write a book to, to Burma and have it sell in the hundreds when I can write a book to Paris and have it sell in the tens of thousands. Well, you clearly know your, your audience, especially your American uh, readership, incredibly well. You've been doing this for a long time. I'm sure you have a lot of um, correspondence with them. Uh, and it's one of the things that's always struck me is that, that is such a great quality of your books is they understand um, that American tourists don't necessarily have months and months to do their traveling. Yeah. Uh, they probably got a couple of weeks, most of them, if they're lucky. You know, I am so tuned into that. I'm not cool at all. A lot of people are too cool for school in that regard. You know, they don't want to uh, accept the fact that their market has the shortest vacations in the rich world. Right. And I'm totally aware of that. My job is not to generate more content. There's plenty of data out there. I need to sort through the superlatives, cut through the superlatives, and help the American use their precious vacation time smarter. My books are for Americans. I, I mean, uh, if uh, Europeans, Canadians, other English-speaking people want to use them, I think that's great. But I really believe in writing for your market, and, and I, I uh, pretty much unapologetically write for the American market. And one thing I like to say is, um, well, you need somebody to help you prioritize for your limited vacation time. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm tired of hearing people say you can spend a lifetime in Florence. Of course you can spend a lifetime in Florence, but I'm an American. I've got 1.5 <laughs> days. How am I going to use them? Right. You know, uh, I, I, you know, if you've got, le what people want is some guidebook writer to say, if you've got less than three weeks for Britain, do not do Oxford and Cambridge. That's redundant. Do one or other of the great university towns and save up time for something different, like the castles in North Wales or a hike in the Cumbrian Lake District. And uh, between Oxford and Cambridge, Cambridge is better. All right. Now we're talking, you see. I mean, it's just my opinion, but for a for a beginner with little time, Cambridge is is a really the classic university town, and it's an easy side trip and so on. So um, these are the sort of uh, itinerary uh, decisions I make, and it, I've got this interesting mix of 25 years of tour guiding experience. So, Clive, I know how many Madonnas and children a mortal tourist can enjoy on one trip. <laughs> I know how many uh, hill towns a typical hot, sweaty, tired, overwhelmed American tourist will want to climb up to in Italy before they'll rather stay in the van and read their iPhone, you know. Um, so, I, uh, so I've got that, that experience of tour guiding, and I've also got the experience of lecturing. I lecture all over the country just like a crazy man. I mean, the, 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 literally the week before we locked down, I was in five cities all over the United States giving talks. And um, that's, I just love doing that. And in doing that, I have a real good sense of what resonates with people. What are the fears and apprehensions on their minds before their trip? And my job is to deal with those. It's a responsibility as a speaker or a writer to respect the time and the energy it's going to take from your reader or, or viewer or tourist to uh, enjoy your work. And uh, on TV, every word has to earn its keep. In my guidebook, it's got to be well designed. It's got to know what are the challenges confronting a tourist. And I've got to be able to write in the mindset of a tourist. Uh, if I'm leading a tour, I got to know what are the anxieties. I always tell my tour guides, our job is to take the anxiety out of travel, to make it relaxing and use people's time efficiently. Um, I've got a really good knack of being kind of clueless and overwhelmed when I come into a new city, just like my readers. I mean, even if I've been in Tallinn before in Estonia, when I stand on the main square, I kind of go, okay, we're going back to scratch now. Where's the, where's the, where's the harbor? Where's the church? Where's the big museum? Where are the good restaurants? And then how do I write it up in a way where a first timer who doesn't know a single word of Estonian will be able to be well organized on their two day side trip from Helsinki? To me, that's just the fun of this work. Well, I, I'm not at all surprised at your success because I think you're incredibly sensitive to Americans' time and, and in fact, to their dollars. You know that they've put a, a significant investment in their trips to Europe. And they've paid for the flight. It's really cheap. Um, yeah. And then I think your books are a very, very uh, canny way of helping them make sure they get the bang for their bucks. Um, Thank you. 
they, they don't waste they you they don't have to waste time in places that aren't going to deliver yeah but i wanted to talk to you a little bit um as you say you've been doing this for a while has your audience over that time has it changed um has it changed in terms of the people that you lecture to do you do you feel it's mm -hmm. the same as it ever was um is travel is travel expanding in in america or is it the same kind of cohort of people that, that travel versus the ones who don't well, there's a couple of dimensions to that. Um, first of all, I don't really think of generations. Maybe that's just a defensive mechanism for somebody who's getting old. But, um, you know, I'm not writing to whatever Gen X or millennials or boomers or anything like that. I'm just a young at heart um, teacher with a young at heart audience. If somebody is PBS demographics, that's fine. If somebody is their children, that's just fine, too. Um, I think there's something more fundamental than packaging something in the way a particular generation wants to consume it. For me, I want to win them over by just having practical information, well-designed, that knows in advance what they need to know when they get there. And I, I do know that because I've stood in uh, a lot of town squares, overwhelmed, not speaking the language, trying to sort things out. So there's that. And then um, I think the main difference in American travelers in the 40 years that I've been doing it is we're more sophisticated now. Uh, when I started traveling, you know, people didn't, I mean, ethnic food was, was pizza, I think, in the United States. And now we're all more global, or those of us who have a curiosity, we reach out even without leaving the United States. I think we take more with us to Europe I like to think we're more sophisticated and more more able to be taught in their travels in a way that assumes a, a little bit of context. Um, we, we've, we're more well-traveled. In the old days, the year rail pass was all 20 countries or whatever, and that sold far more than the country passes. Now, because I sell a lot of year rail passes, the pass that sells is not the all Europe pass, but it is the specific country passes. Hmm. Uh, in the old days, my best of Europe book was the best seller book. Now it's one of the worst selling books. And the best selling books are the, you know, the, the Ireland book or the Portugal book or the Switzerland book or the Italy book. Uh, so we have shorter vacations. We have more travel experience. Uh, we have higher expectations. We have more travel experience. In the old days, it was, if it's Tuesday, it must be Belgium. You know, what's next? Bam, bam, bam. I saw all of Europe. Now, I like to think that we are a little more patient and a little more focused and a little more um, sophisticated in our approach to Europe. In the course of the last you know, several years, there have been times when America has been doing some very unpopular things globally. Uh, were Europeans welcoming of, uh, of a visiting American? You know, when I wrote my first Europe Through the Back Door back in 1980, I think I had a line in there that I was somewhere in Greece and a guy said, came up to me and says, I don't like uh, Nixon or I don't like Reagan or whoever the Republican president was. And he said, but I like you. And that was my line. You know, I don't like America's uh, military policy or this thing or that thing from America. I don't like the president, but you're OK. And that's a very important thing to remember. Uh, Europeans cut individuals some slack because they've all had governments that don't really represent them or the mainstream of their society. I mean, every country's had their their embarrassment or their president that just doesn't reflect the people's will or just maybe not their their political persuasion. Um, and it it goes like a to left to right. And and I mean, from Europeans just are Clinton. They are Obama. You know, they are Biden. Uh, that's just European mainstream. That's not left. That's just right down the middle in Europe. Uh, so it's understandable that the Europeans will have trouble when we have a Nixon, a Reagan, a Bush, or a Trump. Did I miss any? I mean, if you think of the, those personalities from a European perspective, it's bad news. Uh, if you think of Kennedy, Carter, Clinton, Obama, Biden, those are all good news presidents. Those are all presidents that respect the family of nations, that admire people who speak more than one language, 
that don't believe necessarily the world is a pyramid with us on top and everybody else trying to figure it out. There's an ethnocentrism there. America first is not just Trump. You know, uh, all of these other, I mean, when Bush was elected, I, somebody beat John Kerry by putting down John Kerry for speaking French. You know, Clinton had to hide the fact that he studied in England. You wouldn't brag about that to a, to a right-wing base. You would brag about that to a less left-wing base. Um, we have a big discussion now in our world about uh, building walls or building bridges. You know, the uh, one kind of president wants to build walls, another kind of president wants to build bridges. Um, I really think um, when you travel, when you respect the world, you realize, especially looking forward, that the challenges confronting us will be impervious. Is that the right word for it? To uh, the military. You, you can't beat them with bombs and you can't keep them out with walls. Uh, what you beat them with is uh, nations working together, mutual respect, the family of nations, collaboration, and a mindset where we need to build bridges rather than walls. Um, that's just that's just the souvenir you get when you travel. I always like to say, you know, when you travel, the goal is to get out of your comfort zone and talk to people who see things differently. And the most beautiful souvenir is to fly home with a broader perspective. Uh, and I, I, I'm just always concerned. I've been dealing with this for 40 years. How my, If my market is fearful, they're less likely to travel. Um, you know, sometimes we're all afraid, sometimes we're not afraid. When we're, when we're not afraid, we travel more freely. Um, Right now, we've never been more fearful. I mean, it's amazing how fearful our society has been in the last few years. And uh, it's so clear to me. It's almost I want to make a T-shirt that says this. Fear is for people who don't get out much. The flip side of fear is understanding. And you gain understanding when you travel. You know, if you're afraid of Turkey, go there. If you're afraid of gay people, make friends with a gay person. If you're uncomfortable in a black community, why don't you spend a little more time in a black community? Get out of your comfort zone and realize the world's filled with beautiful people. But if you stay home and surround yourself with people who, who look at the world like you do and organize your media and your, your consumption and your all, all of this to, to affirm your, your, your ethnocentrisms or your fears, you're going to be a very fearful person. I think the best thing the world could do if it wanted to make an investment for stability and peace and, and um, international uh, approach to uh, problems that need an international approach is to create a fund that gives every American student a, a, a gap year funded by the rest of the world. Not because they need to do it, because America wouldn't prioritize for it, but we like a good deal. A free trip where you, you, you can't just go to the Bahamas or Hawaii, but you have to go to a country that's going to be challenging to you and get to know the world and then you come home with a with a with an empathy for the other 96 percent of humanity it's the most beautiful beautiful thing we could do uh i'm, I'm just it, that's given that's the way my teaching has evolved over 40 years if, well, if, you know, if i look at it it's like there's a maslow's hierarchy of travel needs so when i started teaching it was the bottom rungs it was how to catch the train how to pack light how to get dinner and in, in a, in a hotel that was my book, Europe Through the Back Door. And then in the 1990s, I, I thought, no, there's more than just budget tricks. And I wrote a book called Europe 101, History and Art for the Traveler. And I was really enthusiastic about teaching people how to appreciate the art and the history and the cuisine, the culture of these countries. And then since 9-11, the pinnacle of that Maslow's hierarchy of travel needs is realizing we got to get out of our comfort zone. We got to get to know the world. We got to broaden our perspective through travel. We got to become better citizens of the planet, as well as perhaps more thankful that we're Americans when we get home. But we've got to open up to the world, uh, take home that beautiful souvenir of a broader perspective. And that's what I call travel as a political act. So I wrote that book. But looking back on 30 years of that kind of travel teaching, I didn't have a grand plan. It was just the natural evolution of a person committed to being a good travel teacher. I just want to make sure that uh, in your listing of the American presidents that all the listeners and viewers of the current picked up that you called the American election in 2020 for Joe Biden. And we're delighted. Thank you. 
Um, <laughs> may it come to be so. Yeah. <laughs> I want to tell you that it's, um, it is wonderful to hear you and to hear you encouraging us to, uh, to get back out there. I, I'm, I'm upstate in New York, um, enjoying the Finger Lakes enormously. There's, a, there's little bits of local culture here, including a thriving uh, Amish community, I believe which I would not have presumed to find. Um, so there's delights to be found in America, but we are all this year going to have a little bit more time on our hands uh, that we might have spent um, traveling further afield um, in other years. I think um, one of the best things we could do with that extra time is to buy a lot of your books and start planning next year's trips. I really, really want to thank you for joining us um, and reminding us why we do this and why it matters and uh, spending a little time in the current Rick Steves. That was great. Thank you. Clive, thank you very much. And you're right that we will be having to use our, our, our travel muscles to while we're home to have that same sort of broadening experience. And it certainly can be done. I'm working on that myself here in my home. I'm, I'm, I'm embracing life as if I'm learning a new culture, cuisine, or language overseas. And there's a lot of uh, old passions we can dust off and, and new wonders that we can embrace and uh, and uh, the, the key is to be aware of those things. So it's great to talk to you and uh, happy travels, even if you're just staying home. Thank you. Hachette.